Thanks for coming along, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for a great turnout. <laughs> this, is really my, this is my alma mater here. I used to come to film lectures in this a version of this theatre before it was restored to its formal beauty. So very nice to be back. It's so nice to be back. With your film? Somebody up there sitting in a seat that, uh, <laughs> that I got from my kids. Well, it's, you know, thank you for bringing the film. Wonderful film. It's the second time I've seen it. And, oh, uh, first time I've seen it. Uh, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> well, I graded it uh, mute, you know, in, in LA Technicolor. So I didn't get a chance to see it at the final soundtrack. Right. So it's really nice to see it on the yeah. screen with an audience and with a properly scored uh, yeah. film. Yeah. So, you, so last time you saw it, you didn't have any of the Not even you. Not even sound. The, 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 wow. the track, the soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. The soundtrack. Right. Right. yeah. Yeah, it's tremendous. So, I mean, I, um, so the first time I saw it, well, I, I've now scribbled all of these other notes on here, so you have to bear with me. But, oh, no. but, but the thing I, that, uh, that, I, that I'd completely forgotten about was that the whole, the, the hotel was a, it was based on a real hotel that existed, that Frank right. Sinatra owned. Yeah, it was. At some point. The germ of the idea came from a, a real place on the border of Nevada and California called the Cali Neva. California, Nevada. Sure. And it was it was a bit of a, a I suppose a, a mafia a haunt, but it was Sinatra owned it at one point, right. and it was where politicians and various other could have the state line, <laughs> yes, and got up to you know right. no good uh, in front of uh, two way mirrors. Okay. So it you know that place did exist, and there are lots of legends. Of, so the about senator it. they sort of reference, they them a name, but you, you it alludes to. Well, even Drew, the director, wouldn't even tell me right. who it was. Okay. But I have a sense. Was it Bobby Kennedy? Was it JFK? Was <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Martin Luther King? Sure, sure. Uh, I I think it might have been Martin Luther King. He was thinking about. Oh, it. Just, that's, I think okay. because right. of the, right. at the very end when the priest the priest gives Cynthia the film. Uh, and it's her choice to burn it. You know? Yes. So I, I think it, it may have been that. Well, who knows? It's a story. So, well, it is a story, but, when, but what's, what I think is interesting is that the, you know, there's a heightened construction to the entire, entirety mm. of the film. And when I was watching it for the second time, um, and, ha and when I watched it the first time, I didn't realise how much was shot in a studio set. Okay. Yeah. So there was this kind of like, I thought there was a correlation between this, this idea of sort of reality or truth or what, 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 what the characters were sort of, you know, nobody's, everyone's withholding something. So, yeah. so in a way, I well, thought that was important. That, it that, is, that it, was it is. That, that it was shot in that way, sorry. No, I mean, the, the director, Drew, always wanted to, to, to make it slightly tuned up, you know, to make mm. it like full of allegory, full of kind of bold uh, chapters. Uh, and he also wanted the, the freedom of shooting in a, in a set. And also we were shooting in Vancouver, which was absolutely Baltically cold. In January. In January. And Earlier it was this be year. Rain. There was all that progression of well, biblical rain that was getting heavier and heavier. So there was sure. no way we could have shot that no. in the freezing cold in Canada. But it also, there were references, film references that we looked at that that films we really loved, like one from the heart, that that you could uh, speak photographically, metaphorically. You know, when you've got something that's slightly uh, artificial, the sense of artifice is very sure. present. Sure. And I, I, I like that the fact that I, I could I could light those uh, night scenes, uh, I could backlight the rain. You know, I had a lot of control of that, and we could switch off the rain. You know, <laughs> when after a take. Which was a great benefit. But, but when you first read the script, I mean, maybe you could talk about how you, how, how you met Drew. Um, mm. But when you first read the script, did you tonally, did you sort of, where did you place it? Did you imagine that it would have such a sense of, art, sense of artifice about it? Or I didn't think it would have as much. And in right. fact, when I met Drew and when I read the script, it did have like a photographic heart to it. And it's, mm. it's definitely the photography kind of 
poured out of the page to me and the sections, the flashbacks and all that, mm. I was were kind of clear to me from the writing actually. Um, but Drew was very keen that, especially in that um, built environment and with the, all the control that's offered to you in, that, right. in terms of lighting and staging and design, not a real location, everything's designed, the costumes, everything, that he didn't want it to be too uh, overwrought, too controlled, too tuned. He wanted a sense of veracity, certainly. He wanted people to connect yeah. with the, the human beings, even though they are allegories, uh, you know, in, in some sense. Yeah. So it was that delicate balance that Drew was always trying to strike, and I was too, of, of doing something that's, that's um, emboldened with, with intent, but which you feel that you're, you're there in a real space. Sure. So does that, yeah. That I mean, maybe we should elaborate, because, I mean, I, when I first saw it, I had no idea um, that the entire thing... Was the, Yes, construction, you know. Yeah. So, so not only the interior of the, of, of the hotel, but also the parking lot and... The, yeah, the day exterior know. as well. So the scale of this, of what yeah. one has to sort of take on... Um, yeah, and it was it was tricky, you know, because the night exteriors are kind of uh, easy to persuade producers to to do in a stage. Sure. But day requires right. um, a lot of light, and especially we're shooting anamorphic on film. Um, so you know, creating ambient daylight required a lot of you know. You can imagine that softbox there above us now multiplied by. 200 yeah um and you say that to the producer and they you know they they balk right. at the idea so it was that and we had great help you know with the film from panavision and who uh, supplied the cameras mm. and c-series lenses and from our lighting company as well up there who who allowed me to use that degree of light and, and produce that with and work within the budget so it it all worked out in the end, and it just everyone was so glad once it was snowing so badly outside that we sure we wouldn't have been able but, to. Film but that. when they committed to to it's Vancouver, wasn't it? Yeah. So when they committed to that, how else did they think one was going to achieve it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, the thing I mean, is that there are a couple of exteriors. We built a partial set exterior right. that had to have sunlight. That so opened when the you film. so when they sorry to interrupt, when they come out of the there's a moment where you sort of come out of the hotel and yeah. I was watching it and seeing the sky and seeing is that yeah. how much you know that was you know there was extension beyond okay so we wow. didn't even use green screen because the edge of the yeah sure the, the they just wrote to it now wrote to it yeah. yeah but the opening of the film was shot in a real place right and it was so cold and so um, like that initial meeting between um, between Jeff Bridges and Cynthia Erivo was actually in an, in an exterior is this where they and, had to thaw the ice yeah, off we the... did and we had to like. Um, I, mean, I think they digitally had to remove the steam from sure, the breath because sure. it was just a nightmare. And that was actually one of the very last things we shot because there wasn't a single day where there was any sunlight throughout yeah. the whole film. So we kept pushing that scene back and back and back. So we shot the first scene at the very end of the movie. Right. Um, yeah. And how did, you, um, how did you get to meet Drew? I mean... Well, Drew, I, I had met because he was a friend of Joss Whedon, the director yes. of the Avengers. So I met, I met Drew. He came on a set visit, right? And uh, we went out for dinner afterwards with Joss, and and he was had been working on Cabin in the Woods, which I love. It's, it was a film that he directed, Drew directed, and he he said that he'd been working on this film that I, I was intrigued by, um, and uh, and then when I was working on The Greatest Showman. Uh, which was a Fox movie, um, and this was uh, produced by Fox. They said, "Look, there's this script that Drew would like to send you." And I said, oh, "Well, I heard really? about this a few years ago." But and when I read it, it was just one of those scripts that you read, and and I find and it like really difficult yeah. to yeah, I like the guy, but yeah. I, I find it so difficult to read a script. It takes me a week or yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, it, sure. You know, you photograph in every scene. You know what it's like. <laughs> so uh, you know, I just yeah. couldn't put this I mean, down. Yeah. I read it in one sitting. Right, right. Well, that's yeah. That's always a good sign. Yeah. yeah, and I rang him up right away and I said, "Please, right, I shoot us, please." And and it was his first, um, his first uh, feature film. 
No, he had actually done Cabin in the Woods before. Oh, sorry, before okay, that. So right. um, this was his second. Okay. And he's okay. written but it's loads. A, but it's a, I mean, it's a, there's a lot going on. It's a big budget, a lot of... Yeah, it was a $32 million budget. Sure. Um, most of which went on the set, I think. You know, right, because, right, right, right. Because right. it, it felt as tight budget-wise as any other right. film I've worked on, or the lower budget films, weirdly. Sure. So I think a lot went into that. It obviously goes a little further in Canada. Sure. But um, it, uh, yeah. But so, you, you obviously have a, you know, many, many films under your belt. Was there, was there a point where you sort of had any reservations about working with somebody that had less on-set experience? No, or was no. There, I mean, how did you... Well, just from the very get-go, the second you meet somebody like Drew, he's mm. such a phenomenally... I mean, he has smart. very experienced as a producer and a, yeah. a writer, I should say. I mean, I'm not, you know... Well, he is, he's a filmmaker. Sure. And he comes from that, it's in his blood. Mm. So speaking to him, you know, he's full of, of references for, for films. He's a real cineast. Mm. He knows his... He's got encyclopedic knowledge of, of cinema and art. So he's somebody that you can talk to. But most importantly, he's, you know, when he talks about uh, emotions and, and his script, he knows inside out. Mm. So it's, it, for me, it was a great pleasure to work with a director who had that knowledge, but also let me a little bit of, like, give me a bit of rope with it. Sure. Because some directors you work with, as you know, can be very didactic about cinematography and say, well, this is, we're here on a 40 and we're tracking from it. Well, it's a, just a different process. Yeah. I mean, you know, you never know what you, especially with somebody you haven't worked with before, you don't know what the process is going to be. Yeah. Sort of we sort of rolled into it very nicely. It was, it was a very easeful, familial process of, of just getting to know everybody. And, I was very lucky I had a crew because I'd worked on a couple of films in Vancouver before um, with uh, the same crew on um, Godzilla and uh, the film I've been trying to get off my MDB, Fifty Shades of Grey. Is there anyone doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone? <laughs> Is there anyone from MDB in the audience? Um, and, but the, the crew I had on those two films were amazing, so I was able to bring them on again. And they, they just, you know what it's like yeah. when you've got a great team behind you who can really yeah. support and carry yeah, you. Sure. Uh, it just, it makes all the difference. Really. Well, also, you know what it's like to not, you know, to, yeah, those, yeah, those both, you know, both scenarios. Where you yeah, think, you know. the other way. And this was a tremendously difficult film for particularly Doug Lavender was the uh, camera focus puller. And, uh, we were shooting, you know, not exactly wide open, but T4 on, on C-series anamorphics, which are, are beautiful and my favorite lenses. Mm. But you can see that there's just nothing there. And sure. he just nailed it. I mean, I was sitting in the seat there, like, you know, <laughs> sphincter tightening with every well, close-up. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, is it a film that you operated on in any capacity? Or? I did a wee bit of operating. I mean, I I think that I'm an okay operator, but when I work with the greats, like on this one, I had Dave Emmerichs, um, and as the camera operator, he also did some steady cam. But on here, you know, I work with many of the greats, Phil Sindel and Pete mm. Robertson, um, who are just incredible. And when you, when you see those people at work, sure. you just say, okay. I'm not I'm standing yeah. by. And also with some of the situations we had, and I love operating, don't get me wrong, but when you have three cameras, particularly in fire and stunts sure, and course. dialogue, Becomes. we often ran two or three cameras for the big dialogue sequences. We shot over a million sure. feet of film. Yeah, I read so, that. Yeah, yeah, so amazing. Kodak did send us three pencils as a gift. <laughs> so um, thank you. Three each. <laughs> three, yeah. But uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. But uh, that way I could sit with Drew the whole time and sure. we could look at the three cameras and, and yeah. assess what we needed to adjust. So yeah. uh, I didn't really want to operate, but I did uh, where there was a seat. When a third camera came on, I would jump on that one, which is great to get back in the saddle again. Sure. It's just like, yeah. yeah. Well, I've heard stories about you putting 5Ds on process trailers. and Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, obviously a, I didn't do any digital on this. We shot 16 on this. For all the newsreel footage and oh, black and white on the TV, we, we shot right, all that right. on, on 7222, mm. uh, 16 mil, 
with a little SR2. I had not one of those in my hand since in a while. It was so lovely to to project an image and see grain again. Sure. That was just yeah. beautiful. Well, uh, that brings me to my next question about film and and obviously the it, well. This was shot uh, predominantly 500, well, exclusively 500 Exclusively. Seat? Even all the, uh, the LA bright sunshine stuff. Mm, right. We shot, I love 519. And, you know, in an effort to pr persuade the producers, who were actually really good about us, normally it's a bit of a battle to shoot on film. But from the outset, Drew always wanted to shoot on film, and I did right. too. And right. then it was the anamorphic, we, you know. But uh, we shot everything on, on film. Yeah. All on the same? On the, the same stock and it yeah. reduced the amount of short ends we would, sure. were going to have. It, it just meant I didn't have to change my meter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just, I love, what I love about that stock is it has teeth. Uh, and some of the, the slow speed stocks, I mean, it seems weird saying this, but they, they have a perfection of plasticity that I, I, I well, always reacted to. No, I found the same thing with 45 years where we did where we shot two, I, I always end up this thing where I shot 250, 550, and then when every time we cut to the 50, yeah. it never felt like it sat within it the, the film. Same. So then the next film I didn't, you know. But it, yeah. It's a very unique stock that, I mean, specific and great for certain projects, but mm. I'm, I'm so glad that we're able to have the choice. It's so exciting Absolutely. to yeah. sit down with the director and he said, what should we do? Should we shoot on? film and what stock should we use and so was it ever was there ever a discussion for this film no no from day one it was always digital and i went straight to the producer jeremy latcham with whom i'd worked on the avengers and that was a digital film and i said jeremy we want to shoot this digital uh, on film not digitally and he kind of had, in the back of his mind he budgeted a digital option sure but they were tremendously supportive and they just I, I didn't even have a discussion with them mm. beyond that. It was just like, okay. And same with the studio, Fox were right. totally supportive. It was great. Yeah. It's yeah. unusual because normally it's a, no, it's no, a bun I fight. Know. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So one, uh, another thing I wanted to ask you was just this. Um, it felt like, for, from what I've read about, um, there's a great interview in British Cinematographer, by the way, um, where a lot of the, I was sort of avoiding the, the obvious sort of technical questions because I think the interviews, uh, the article is very good. Right. And, uh, and it's interesting to sort of have a, a more philosophical or, uh, you know, it's a slightly more in-depth discussion. Yeah. However, but um, uh, I was just going to say that in the article, there was, a, there was a, a sense that when you read the script, or I got a sense that when you read the script, um, there were, you know, in terms of colour or production, there was things that might feel slightly prescriptive when you're reading it. And it, you know, so... Well, they were... They was that were, an aid or, is, or was it... It was, it, it was it in this little... sense because when it comes from the imagination of Drew Goddard, you know, they're, they're properly distilled. Right. You know, that sometimes you get prescriptive, photographically prescriptive sure. material that you're just thinking, this is completely at odds with what I would yeah. imagine myself yeah, as I yeah, read yeah. the script. So this one, when I read the script and there were cues, like there's a, a big track, like mm. this, the big long uh, track in the, in the corridor that you see that, yes. that follows Which, I, John which I want to ask you about. Oh, right. Well, that was written in the script. Oh, okay. And all the, the rooms, the colours of the rooms were all specifically annotated and written in the script. Drew had it all figured out before I came on board. So none of that is my idea, the big shot. The, 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 well, see, this is people interesting. People say, oh, it's because... a signature <laughs> thing, big shots. And I didn't come up with the atonement oh, big okay. shot either. That, okay. In fact, I argued against it. That right. was all Joe's. Well, that, that was my question. Because <laughs> there, there is a sense that, the, that those long takes are a, become Not a really. trademark of your work. No, I'm happy for the atonement one because it got me an Oscar nomination. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, it wasn't my idea. No, sure. And Joe no. loves those sort of shots. Mm. I'm not a great fan of big long shots, actually. Um, so is there, is there, is, is, I'm not. <laughs> so is there anything that you absolutely insist upon photographically? I mean, do, I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but is there anything that you well, a discussion that you, about it? Yeah. That's that's what I love about Drew. Yeah. 
and with Joe, in fact, like when I, I said, really, Joe, that's so self-indulgent to do a big <laughs> shot in, in atonement like that. It's, it looks like a peacock. Right. Uh, instead, right. of we've, we've really thought about the photography up until that. And I said the same thing to Drew in this film. I said, it's, it's just like, it's a bit of a show off shot. Is that, is that because, is that, but that's interesting because is that a, just a sort of personal go-to where it's not the, the idea of sort of, the idea of that peacocking or that celebrating, yeah. you know, because I can understand what you're saying <laughs> and it's not my, I mean, when, you know, so in films I've shot recently that I'm very proud of, I would absolutely say that all of that, that, that stuff comes from the director and it's the film they want to make, and you know what? Yeah. That that's what they had in their head, and well, it is. They're also editing it, so and I had to of... respect that. And actually, when I started talking, saying, "Is this a show-off shot?" Drew said, "Look, here's why I want it," mm. and it was about the building of tension uh, slowly. It was about introducing with unequivocally and without a lie of a cut the idea of looking into the rooms. It was about witnessing the things happening in real time uh, uh, between the rooms, which mm. was sort of uh, essential to the film. It was about introducing the idea of reflection. So we had these beautiful half silvered mirrors, like beam splitter glass that was the art department made, right. that we could extract reflection in camera. There were no v visual effects to get the, the, the which they'd actually budgeted for. They were all going to have to have GoPros inside right. and match the, you know, the, the effect. We'll never shoot without glass. This is what visual effects were suggesting to me. And I was like, we can do this in camera, which sure. black well, ourselves out. Was it this the glory, is this with the glory hole? What yes, the, yes, we built a little glory hole. Are you allowed to say that these days? I think so. <laughs> well, you have said I don't it, know. So it's out there now. I'm on telly as well. Um, but. Um, <laughs> Oh, good. And he never worked again. Um, but we had a glory hole, and uh, it was a little. We had the ca the Panavision camera wrapped in, in black, but we also had like a, a card with a, a a mirror in front, and we were looking right. through that. Um, and it, it was remotely operated on on a Libra head. Right. It's and incredible, the grip, incredible sequence that take. I mean, it's, what is it? Five minute take. Yeah, those, it's music? yeah, a bit longer. It's and fantastic. It, it's just because it had been previewed to death by the director of Drew, right. and and they'd kind of done what's called a tech viz, where you, you work out how to do it. So when I came on board, they'd already worked out. We take the side of the the corridor out. We do it on a 30 foot techno crane. There's like a hundred feet of track. Right. The, ca the camera's pickling in and out. Uh, it's, it's all, and I was like, we'll never hide the reflections. We'll not be able to react to the John Hamm's, the vagaries of his sure. movement on, with such a cumbersome device. So yeah. let's do it just on a dolly. We had one of the greatest dolly grips in the world, Ryan Monroe, uh, who was basically the operator, you know, and right. so he was there again, looking like a, a ninja, like in yeah. a, in yeah. all dressed in a black leotard. Yeah. And, uh, and he was pushing the dolly and, and moving around. And, and uh, Ham was amazing, John Ham, uh, because he was, he's just great at, at, you know, an actor can suggest when they go for a, a move. Uh, just with a, with a, uh, anticipating a move. Actually, J Jeff Bridges does that uh, as well because if he had, if he's standing up out of a chair, he does this dolphin noise. So he goes like, <laughs> <laughs> so the, <laughs> see, you didn't get that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he does that. You ready? <laughs> For whose benefit is that? Well, it's for the own. operator, because you're sitting on the <laughs> operator. If you're operating and somebody just stands out of the chair and you <laughs> crush the headroom. Yeah. But with yeah. the dolphin, <laughs> <laughs> so it was such a great thing for him yeah. to do. And, you know, and actually, he, he wrote a really what? lovely thing at the end of the film to me. He said, you know, make sure I'm gar you must credit Dolphin on this movie. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he's an actor that I would, uh, you know. Dream. Oh, he's amazing. When I was a, when I was a kid, watching movies and wanting to do I always I was completely convinced he was the guy that played Chewbacca for some reason I made this correlation <laughs> I was like it made perfect is. sense when I was eight or nine or whatever, that there was 
He wasn't, could well have. Doesn't matter, but it, you know, <laughs> but I, you know, he's such but a he fine, takes these amazing you know. pictures on set. He has yeah, this wide yeah. lux camera that that, yeah. that takes pictures, and he made this beautiful book, limited edition book that he gives out to all the crew members on every film he does. They're real treasures, so yeah, I'm very glad to yeah. have one of those. And what? And I should ask about uh, the sort of technical aspects of the film for those that haven't, you know, read read the. Yeah. the Cinematographer, cinematographer article, but mm. what's, uh, I mean, it was obviously shot on film, 500T, yep. and yeah. processed where? Photochem, uh, Photochem in Burbank in Los Angeles. Right. We sent it down from Canada, and we did some shooting in, in Malibu on the beach, and yes. uh, that field of yellow flowers. Which is still, all across the board, 500T, so yes. even the, on the yeah. water and the... Yeah, all that stuff. And was, they had no concerns that, that, would, that it should have been shot any, on any other stuff? Well, you know, we could have done it on 200, mm. but, you know, I sort of, I, I really love that stock. And, you know, mm. we, all, the only problem was it was a bit of a pain because we had to end it down, but a lot of that stuff was shot of remote heads. So yeah. the difficulty is if you're looking through a film yeah. camera <laughs> with that amount of ND and, and bright you look sun. Up. Probably. Yeah, you can't see anything. It's just yeah. horrible to look through. Yeah. I'm talking to you about it, but it's like no, 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 no. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, it it wasn't really. We didn't want to treat those flashbacks in any other way. We didn't want to amp up the the visuals or or use heavy filtration or do anything. We thought that the milieu, the period, would would tell or signal it for yeah. itself. Sure. And we just shot it in a in a way the the actors kind of carried the the flashback, and uh, and the, maybe we used a more kind of innocent perspective. You know, for instance, on the beach, just embracing flare, mm. or the walk in the woods, just consciously using that beautiful yeah. characteristic sea sea series, blue line flare, yeah. and and the the chromatic nature of the lenses, which I absolutely adore. I just love what that does because we we didn't use any filtration at all right. on the lenses, and you could see just and the grade was very simple as well in the DI. So where, just, did you, where was the DI? It was at a Technicolor, uh, Steve in Scott. LA. Yeah, right. and Steve Scott was the colorist, who's uh, just a genius. Uh, so, it, but it was it was straightforward, but a, a gentle approach. We didn't want to twist the image too hard. Sure. So certainly, cosmetically speaking, we didn't we didn't do that. The seas are just amazing, but a little bit of overexposure on on a key light, they just are so creamy mm. in, the, in the highlights. Mm. I love them. Well, I think not only the uh, not only the photography was intimidating, but also Chris Hemsworth uh, yeah. body, which I, to... I know it was fun when we we did twenty seven takes that way, you know. of that shot of him ding 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 ding, ding, ding coming towards. <laughs> And like after after twenty seven takes, and Drew was loving it. Like he said, "Let's do another one. Let's do another one." And after a while, me and the AD were like, "Who's going to tell Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Goddard?" <laughs> because uh, it was he was loving it so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really will never work again now. <laughs> okay, open up. Keep it closed. Oh, well, there we go. Well, now I'm going to have to embarrass myself by looking at some questions. Um, da, 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 da. I love the rake of this theatre. It's fantastic. I've never been in a theatre with such a keep, steep keep rake. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I sing a few songs, though? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was, it was one of those films that was uh, a rarity. It comes along when you do a, a film like this that is uh, the script and it just offers you so much possibility. Sure. For, exploring things and for me it was the collaboration with the designer was as important as, as no, the director. I was, ask you, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Yeah, because he, Martin I'd worked with before Martin on another, West. yeah, Martin West and he was an art director for many years. Had you and worked with him as an I artist? had, I worked with another one that I want to speak to IMDB about, Along Came Polly, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> he was the art director and Along Came Polly and uh, but we got on great on that one. But he just, from the get-go, because a, a big room like that, that we're going to be shooting necessarily on 40 mil lenses and yeah. very wide lenses and seeing everything and seeing effectively 360 for sure, some of the shots. Sure. 
we knew that we had to build in practical lights into the, into the set. And Martin was amazing. He just said, look, from day one, show me what you need, where you need it, and we'll do that. So he built in these soft boxes, very like what we see here, actually, that at least give me a little bit of ambience right. um, to, to give an exposure level that I could sure. change. And one side, California, we used sky panels, so they were slightly warmer. The cooler side on the other, I love sky panels. Oh, well, yes, you haven't spoken about that like that. Uh, no, yeah. not because I haven't asked you. But the, idea, <laughs> but the idea that you would have this kind of divide, I mean, how yeah. much did that, you know, because obviously there's a history and there's a jumping off point historically, and it's, you know, how yeah. much did you then lean into that? Well, that was it. You know, there was aesthetic. that very definite split between the two that we okay. tried. One was at 4,300 right. Nevada and the other one was at 2,800 okay. Kelvin, degrees Kelvin. Right. So, you know, that was lovely to, to play with that. Sure. Um, and then, but within that, there were structural things that I thought were really clever that Martin built into the set. Because obviously there's lots in the film, which is allegorical in terms of the the sort of Catholicism, I don't mean in a doctrinaire way, but there is plenty of that through the film. There are kind of religious iconographies, there's moralist ideas within that about good and evil and, sure. lo, you know, well, it truth would and to lies. Movie, I suppose. And, yeah. Everyone's and the, the, the elemental nature, like the water and the fire. Biblical. And, yeah, there's all yeah, that sure. stuff. The, the yeah. few locusts would have gone amiss as well. <laughs> but throughout that, you know, he built in like cruciform images throughout the, 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 the set in the dividers right. And, right. and the little splits between uh, the images. And, you know, that was, that was great to see that at an early stage and, and work with him on that, saying, look, why, why don't we make this, that glass the glass partitions gimbalable so that I can get sure. double imagery through things. And he, sure. he was very receptive to those ideas. As long as you get in early with design, yeah. they can help yeah. enormously sure. to make your job easier. So was it, did it, for when you first read the script, did it feel like all of these characters were, I know in a way they were sort of, um, it wasn't a naturalist, you know, sort of, mm. Film. It, there was a, you know, there was sort of, there were these very stylized. But, but did it? Did each of these characters feel they have these redemptive qualities? They were all on a at the end of yeah. a. Yeah. There of was a, kind a of journey. journey. I mean, yeah. it was yeah, exactly that. It was uh, going towards a, a point at the end. Sure. It was interesting. I, I sort of liken it to a bit like like Cluedo or something. Yeah, that yeah, the, 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 yeah. the characters were all that. Uh, ciphers of of different characters, sure. and that uh, extended to. They're colour characters, you know, they all had little colour identities. Yeah. Uh, you know, Darlene's character had the green of her wall, the yellow, the mm. mustard and green. And uh, there was purple in, uh, sure. in Emily's uh, room. There was obviously the red of Hemsworth yeah. and the Black portentous and for, um, the old, for, old for priest. Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was, that was good to play with. But, but but interesting early on, like how how far does one take that? Because you can take that to this incredibly heightened. Yeah. You can hit an end stop with that. With that, where then it. Be, we then did go there in prep actually, well, okay. and that was one of the benefits of of a fairly longer extended prep. You know, we had maybe eight weeks, which is is a great length for prep for me. Yeah. And it, at the start, it was a little bit he heavier handed. And Drew, as we got towards the production, was was kind of getting more nervous about about. Were you getting nervous? Both. As a DP, I'm or? always nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I am, but I like to be. I like to be nervous uh, because yeah, you look keener, you look harder uh, at, at what you have to do. But um, I don't get nervous when the clapperboard goes. Sure, but no, I that's get, an I'm interesting not, yeah, point, actually. That's, it's almost like There's the, something the breath. Uh, that the, 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 it becomes a sanctity, sanctity of the space uh, mm. happens once the clapperboard hits. Well, I, I always think there's a kind of absolute like doubt about what one does. And as soon as your, your eyes at the eyepiece, you would race into tigers coming towards you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're oh, like, I do. Well, don't I only mean that in, a, in the sense that you're sort of absolute assurance and sort of you would 
You know what I mean? Oh, I, you I once did a video. It was a, just a dodgy old music video, but it was for Brian Adams. Actually, it was a live concert thing, and it was at Wembley Stadium. And I remember we had a 16 mil camera to ex express this notion mm. of, of the cinema world mm. and, and, the, and the real world. For sure. And, you know, we, we got it from B stage, which is at one end of the sta stadium, ran in, got in the back of a golf cart, sped along a corridor in the middle of a song with the drummer going, <laughs> chur, 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 raced up the stairs, you know, onto this round wide angle lens and behind Brian Adams and the, the, the spotlights towards me. And then I just saw the little red light for the film had ended. <laughs> <laughs> he started the, the song and I took the thing down and everybody's going, Summer of 69, and I'm like, <laughs> like scuttling off Suddenly stage. you were just everybody but, else. You know? Like trying to get the camera back up to my eyeball but see where it was going. It's very, uh, I know. Terrifying. And it was so funny because the director said, you've just got to see this. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because the other camera had me in the frontal shot. He said, I, I, well, don't worry, I won't use this. But it's yeah. just like me going puce. But, but it is strange. As a, I mean, I remember, I remember shooting a short film and being on the edge of a, a platform. You know, mm. the, the, the short film that got me my first film. All right. And I was on the edge of a platform. And this tr the director wanted half the shot, the train pulling through in the Cotswolds, and half the shot. And I would, you know, I was just, I, I, Ready for I was it. not moving for anyone. Had I actually kind of put the camera down and realised that... You'd be that, that meant, toast. Yeah. Oh, God, but, thank God. You know, only, only, only set to illustrate because you sort of... Well, I'm glad you... Because one is assured... <laughs> You're here. One is, one is assured in the moment of shooting something... Yeah. Far more than in the prep, you know. And you will have, in the prep of a film, you'll have two hours discussing something that you would solve in five, ten minutes on set because you have to. There's yeah, a very strange exactly. process in life. Anyway, sorry. No, that's, that's <laughs> good. I mean, it actually, you know, we were jesting about it, but it does bring up safety on set well, and, and, and why that you can get lost in, 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 in setting stuff up that's, that, it, that doesn't acknowledge that. And it's good to have people responsible around who can say, listen, let's be, be sensible about this. Because a film, you know, it's only a film. No, after all. but it, but it's also, but it's 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 what we do and what we're incredibly passionate about mm. doing. So we, you know, we sort of yep. we care and get so involved. You know, well, I have to. Anyway, I'd like to open it up to the floor, if I may. Come on, some questions, surely. There's one backstage there. Hello. Uh, oh, oh, could we? Do you have a mic? Is there a mic? We have. To, sorry, we have to. Uh, Make sure that all questions have a, a mic as we're recording it. Hi. Uh, my question was when you talked about, um, you said you talked to Fox about shooting film, and they, even though they had Belgian it digitally, they said, okay, let's shoot film. Why do you think they were so compliant so quickly and so easily? Well, it was just, I, I was able to present them with a you know, case study of two films I'd I'd recently shot, where that debate had been given to me a bit more vociferously at that point, that we must shoot digitally because it's cheaper. And I was able to show them that actually that was, wasn't the case. In fact, it was, the, if not on a par, but it was cheaper to shoot on film. In the end, and with Drew, he likes a lot of takes, so it went right through the roof budget-wise. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Everyone who wants to shoot on film, Fox won't allow it anymore. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, the, the, I was able to show on nocturnal animals because of the the discipline of shooting on film and you know the takes and not running the camera just ad nauseum um, for take after take and doing resets while the camera's rolling. Uh, you know, that was possible with, with proper dis on-set discipline. And which Drew loved that. I mean, he would cut the camera between takes, but he just, uh, he loves a lot of takes because I suppose it's the writer in him as well, loves to, you know, get different uh, versions of, of the performance, the delivery. So um, we did shoot quite a lot on that one. But there was, in the, the worst case scenario, I think it, 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 it worked out at like a quarter of a million dollars more expensive to shoot on film if, you know, because we shot a million feet, 
So, which is nothing really in, 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 a, in a $32 million film when you think of what it meant for, for, for the film and what it meant to the director and meant to everyone and the look of the film, I suppose. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I was talking to Joe Danton was here earlier and he said, make sure you talk about emotion and the emulsion, which I thought was a lovely uh, phrase. He said a friend of his had told him about that, this phrase, that it's emotion and the emulsion. Which is catchy, but uh, it is true no, that there is something alchemical happens with film, and I love digital. Sure. I really do. I love it so much. But um, if something happens, these little surprises that you sure. just can't predict that are special. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I loved how it recorded, recorded, depicted, um, color. Uh, well, also the reds. Yeah. You know, cause well, been, especially. I think everyone you know, that shoots has been in a situation where they're working on digital format with red, you know, and recently, you know, in the last year or so, I had to sort of end up gelling car headlights in order to add red to them. The, you know, the way that red is just, yeah. appears on film is a very specific thing and you always get this pinky orangey mm. version uh, that is so just true. not true on, you know, so far. On, uh, yeah, on film it just looks like a stained glass window when you yeah. see it, when you see it prints. Like for yeah. we got regular prints through the shoot just for just to check that everything was okay and you sure. know that it wasn't. And it, it was just so lovely to see a print. But didn't you also with the with the El Royale sign? Didn't you supplement it with the whole banks of? Uh, I, I did because I. Sort of I mean, there was red. quite a lot out of that neon. But sure. when you're looking at it. The, the neon was dimmable, actually, which was right. great, because it, at full pelt, it, 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 it just exposed white or very pink. So we, we always had it very low, low, and then I enhanced it with 20K, a 20K gelled primary red, mm -hmm. and then also a wash of uh, downlight with sky panels, which is great. You can match that color exactly. I love those things. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, what we did there. Just. But when we looked this way, I just turned the neon up full of whack and it did all the light for me. So yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a great, great device. Another question? Just uh, how long did it take to shoot the film? And uh, same question, I said, how many takes was the av average of it, economy? It, I think we shot for 50 days. Yeah, it was quite a long t uh, shoot. But um, we averaged quite a few takes every setup. You know, more than any film that I've ever worked on. It was an average of maybe 14 to 15 takes per setup. So it meant that we had to work really fast in our, in our lighting, you know, uh, because we wanted to give the director as much time with the actors as possible and as many takes. So I, I worked really, really simply with, uh, with keys and obviously the, the ambience was taken care of with, because we'd lit it in advance. But I generally speak, and, uh, you know, I just moved around soft sources around the set uh, and worked in a very simple, like literally a key light a large key light and probably that was about it sometimes a bit of backlight but i usually added very little fill uh, so it was the the lighting was incredibly simple um uh to to make sure that it was like 15 minutes between setups and that way drew could have as much time and as many takes as he wanted right yeah Down here on the left. Hi, Seamus. Hi, hey, Roger. <laughs> Two questions, actually. One that's a follow up from that, because of having been on various sets, doing that many takes usually drives the actors mad more than anybody. So, how was that dealt with? And the more technical question I have is you said there was no visual effects at all on the, on the mirrors, but I, how, there were two shots where you tracked behind but, yes. um, the actor and their reflection. That must yes. have been a green screen, no? 
Well, the first question, yes, it, it did drive the actors a bit nuts, but, but a lot of actors really love it, particularly Jeff Bridges loves to explore and cogitate over a performance and, and, oh, really? and like, hey, let me, let me throw this one in. Right. I, I couldn't do it. I mean, all the actors were doing impersonations of Jeff Bridges, and I, by the end of it, I was too, but I wouldn't, not on camera anyway, do an impersonation <laughs> of Jeff Bridges. But it was, there was a competition. Lewis Pullman actually does, who plays the bellhop guy, does the best impersonation of Jeff. Um, but he was the one, the only one who didn't, he just loved it. He could do like a million takes and, and love the millionth. But Drew liked to see where it would take an actor in their performance, whether it would annoy them. And if that's what he, usually sometimes that's what he wanted, that a kind of a pissed offedness in the performance. And, and sometimes he got that. So sometimes it was just to get what he wanted and sometimes it was to provoke a reaction. Um, the other question about visual effects yes that 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 image we we did that for real with a real mirror but uh we had uh ryan monroe we we, we covered our libra head it was a remote head uh, in green and we tracked around and then we did plates in the same move um that would uh, for, sorry from the opposite direction you know on the, on the curve so that the visual effects could could uh, match it in there were, I mean, there were lots of visual effects in the film, usually set extension, but um, uh, there were sort of velvet touches, if you like, in the, in the film. There, were, there weren't big visual effects in the film. Even the fire was all real. At the end, it was all, you know, it was boiling in there. You burnt the set? Well, yeah, I mean, Joel West, Martin West, the designer's uh, brother, was the special effects coordinator, and he... Mm. Pyromaniac. Yeah, pyromaniac, brilliant guy. <laughs> and, uh, he, it's always good to It was all gas, so it would turn on, and by, by the end of it, like even a one minute take, mm. we were all like, I looked like the man yeah. who fell to earth by the end of it. I had no <laughs> eyebrows or anything. That was good fun. Final question? Yeah, um, for me, the film. Se seem to have, have a feel of, of, of an earlier era, have a sort of Hitchcock feel about it. And you mentioned that, that, um, that the style sort of jumped out of the page at you as you were reading it. So to what extent was that, um, between you and the director, to, to what extent did you negotiate that? And was that stylistically what he was going for? Did he feel that you wanted those long, extended feeling to everything? Yes, definitely. I mean, there are cues that are in like there are music cues in there that that reinforce that that, that herman esque bernard uh, and uh, uh also the the, the era uh, suggests that and and maybe the 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 fact that there isn't a lot of cutting which he uh, drew loves hitchcock and uh, you know building tension through uh, like absence and, and space that's why we wanted to play with uh, framing and, and using the anamorphic frame and, and creating a sense of uh, potent uh, absence in, in, in the, the other side of the frame. But uh, he, he loves all those Hitchcock films. We talked about Hitchcock, we talked about, um, well, we talked about black and white. Weirdly, for such a, a, a colorful film, we talked about black and white noir uh, as such, but we wanted to make a, a color noir uh, and and to create in in like the corridors and when the film did go darker, a sense of uh, monochromatic approach, but with hints of color in there. Um, so starting with the hopeful vivid color and then just degenerating into some weird monochromatic Hades. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was lovely having those discussions. It's lovely when you can meet a director and, and go through images and look at books and, and say, let's go this direction or let's go, and be in an art department, which is my favorite part of prep is wandering in there and just mulling over all the images around that, that, that can be a whole kaleidoscope of possibilities that may or may not be adopted, but which are, are all, uh, you know, potentials. And, and deciding there and then, well, let's do this and let's do that and let's make something that's coherent visually and that everyone is on the same page. I mean, that's the 
exciting thing for me about sure. about prep with the possibilities. Yeah, and on the, 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 the kind of democracy of ideas that happens mm. with, with all the departments where you just you realize that cinematography is not uh, is not a one person band. Sure. It's it's definitely, you know, the, the collaboration of, of all those departments. Well, it's a very nice note to leave it on, I think. Seamus McGarvey, thank you thank so you much. Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming along, everybody. Yeah, that was, thank uh, you so much. That was terrific.